Hey everyone, uh, we're going to talk about the central limit theorem and how that leads into something called confidence intervals. Okay, so when you do a study, you get some sample mean. And that sample mean is not equal to the population mean. If you were to do the study again, right, so you have one sample mean and then you have another sample mean if you were to do the study again. You might have a different sample, so you're going to get a different result. Someone else might do the study, they'll have a third sample mean. Someone else could do the study, they'll have a fourth sample mean, and so on. And all of those sample means, they're probably not equal to the population mean, and they're not equal to each other. So, why is a sample mean useful? The population mean, that's the thing you want. Your sample mean is not equal to it, and your sample mean is not even unique. So, why do we use it? Well, the short answer is, we assume that the sample mean is somewhere around the population mean. But what does somewhere around mean? Okay. Sample mean is somewhere around the population mean. Does that mean it's 5 off or 100 off or 5,000 off or 0 0.1 off? We want to be more specific, right? What do we mean by more specific? Well, if we can say something like we are 95% confident that the sample mean is within say 10 of whatever you're measuring, meters, kilometers, kilograms, of the population mean. Now that's a quantitative statement. Not we think it's somewhere around. No, but we are 95% confident that it is 10 or within 10 of the population mean. That's where we want to get to. And that's where we'll be using the central limit theorem and confidence intervals. The central limit theorem states the following, okay? The distribution of sample means of size n of any random variable with mean mu and standard deviation sigma will approach the normal distribution centered around mu as n approaches infinity. Okay. Now, that's a lot of words. Okay. Here's what it means. Like we discussed, you can have many different sample mean values. One sample mean, you do the study again, another sample mean, you do the study again, another sample mean, and so on. Can you predict what your next sample mean will be? Can you predict what will your fourth sample mean be based on what the previous sample means were? No, you can't. 
And what do we call that when you have a mathematical object where you cannot predict its next value based on the previous values? That's called a random variable. So just like your actual values are a random variable, the values of whatever it is you're measuring, your sample means are also a random variable. And just like any random variable, they have a mean value and they have a standard deviation. And they have a probability distribution. You're more likely to observe certain values of that random variable than other values. What the central limit theorem tells you is that as the sample size that you use to get those sample means, as that sample size increases, technically, you'd say mathematically, as that sample size approaches infinity, because there are different ways of increasing, okay? Uh, and we're talking about the kind of increasing where as it gets, as it approaches infinity, okay, the distribution of your sample means, the distribution of all the sample means you could possibly get, it gets closer and closer to the normal distribution. Okay, now if you're gonna talk about normal distribution, you have to talk about its mean value and its standard deviation. Its mean value is the population mean of the original random variable. Now that's pretty intuitive, okay? Of all the sample means you could possibly get, you're more likely to have sample means that are closer to the population mean of the data that you're collecting. Now, as for standard deviation, the width of your normal distribution, well, the population mean of your sample means will approach the population mean of the random variable. The standard deviation of your sample means that's actually going to approach the standard deviation of your random variable divided by the square root of n, where n is the sample size that you use to collect those sample means. Okay, What that means is that the larger the sample size in your sample means, the smaller the standard deviation of your sample means. If your sample size is bigger, your sample means are going to be closer together. Now, this is also intuitive because if you have a larger sample size, if you happen to have an outlier in that sample, well, there's a whole lot of outliers that are going to balance out that sample mean. Whereas if your sample size is quite small, you have an outlier in that sample size well, you don't have a lot of other values that will balance out that average. So with a smaller sample size, you're more likely to have values far away from the population mean. With a larger sample size, you're less likely to have values far away from the population mean. And so your sample means are going to be closer together. Now, how can we use that to make predictions? Well, that's called finding the confidence interval. All right. So any sample mean we get, we want some estimate as to what's the difference between our population mean and our sample mean. Now, the only way to know exactly the answer to that question is to know the population mean. And if we know the population mean, well, we don't even need the sample mean. So practically, we never actually know the answer to this question, okay? But we do wanna create an estimate for it. And here's how we can do that. Let's say there's some margin of error such that the difference between our population mean and our sample mean is within that margin of error, okay? And we want to know the probability of the difference between our population mean and our sample mean being within those bounds. 
and the probability is equal to some lowercase p. Okay, so for example, we want to say with the probability that the difference between our sample mean and our population mean is 10, well that's equal to 0 0.95. Okay, so maybe our sample mean is 5 and the population mean is 13. Okay, well the difference between the two is negative 8. Maybe our sample mean is 3 and our population mean is 1. Well the difference between the two is 2. Okay, so again this is greater than negative 10. This is smaller than positive 10. If the difference between our sample mean and the population mean is less than 10, what that means is the sample mean minus the population mean will be less than positive 10 and greater than negative 10. And we want to state something like, well the probability of that happening is 0 0.95. Now that's a quantitative statement. That's a useful value. We're saying whatever our sample mean is, we don't know our population mean but there's a 95% chance that it is within 10 of that sample mean, right? So in this case, we can say, well, there's a 95% chance that the population mean is from negative seven to positive 13. In this case, we can say we're 95% sure that the population mean is from negative 5 to positive 15 as an example. That's where we want to get to. So in this case 10 is our margin of error. So how do we get there? Well just like working with any equation I'm going to do the same thing to every part of this inequality. Specifically I'm going to divide by the standard deviation of our sample means. And I'm going to do one more thing. This population mean here, instead of writing the population mean of the random variable, I'm going to write the population mean of the sample means. Now I can do that because as our sample size approaches infinity, well we expect that the population mean of the sample means, the average of the averages, does approach the population mean of the random variable. So we're assuming our sample size is close enough to infinity that we can treat them as being equal to each other. And that's why I made that change from here to here. Okay. Now if we look at that central term here, we see a random variable, we subtract the population mean of that random variable, and we divide by the standard deviation of our random variable. Well that's conversion to the z scale. So we can actually rewrite this equation as follows. Because at least we know now that we are on the z scale. Now, just like we divided by the standard deviation of the sample means before, now we're going to multiply by that standard deviation. And now, instead of writing things as the population mean of the sample means or the standard deviation of the sample means, 
we're going to write that in terms of the population mean and standard deviation of our initial random variable. Now, if you recall, that's what they are here. We're assuming the sample size is large enough that we can say the population mean of the sample means, the average of your averages, is equal to your population mean, and the standard deviation of your sample means, the standard deviation of your averages, is equal to the population standard deviation divided by root n. So instead of sigma sub x bar, we're going to write sigma over root n. Instead of mu sub x bar, we're just going to write mu. And instead of z times sigma over sub uh, sigma sub x bar, we're going to write z sigma over root n. So, what this statement means is that the probability that the difference between our sample mean and the population mean is within the bounds z sigma over root n, well the probability of that is this small p. What is that p? Well that's the z value, that's the probability corresponding to your z value. And we'll do a number of examples to show you how you can do this calculation. So our conclusion is that x bar plus or minus z sigma over root n is the p percent confidence interval where p corresponds to the z value. Okay, now this would actually be p times 100 percent. Next we'll do a number of examples that will solidify this.